This week on the Destination Angler. How do you go about inventing a fly? Like, how does that start for you all? The skies open up and I have a vision. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. I, I have no idea where the stuff comes from sometimes. Uh, and a lot of it's just like you're trying to improve on something or like, I just want to see if this will work. Okay. Like, do you get some motivation or inspiration while you're out on the stream and think, when I get back to my vice, I'm going to tie up this or that? I do. Oh, yeah, com- I do. Completely. For sure. Yeah. And some of yeah. it is the fish weren't quite eating. It didn't quite look right or something. Was I amiss. can't get it. I can't get it to float or I can't see it. Welcome to the Destination Angler Podcast, the podcast for anglers who travel. And I'm your host, Steve Haig. We go right to the source, the local guides and experts to build your knowledge of top fishing locations around North America. It's a big world out there. Now go and fish it. I'm going away for a while, but I'll be back soon. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey anglers, welcome back to another episode of The Destination Angler, brought to you by J.P. Ross Fly Rods, makers of happiness one rod at a time. Get outside and simply fish. You can join in the conversation with the Destination Angler on social media. And hey, man, if you like the show, please hit that share button on your podcast app and tag a buddy. We have some great shows coming your way. How about Redfish on the Fly on the Texas coast? Then we're headed to Paradise Valley, Montana, and the one and only Nelson Spring Creek to hear from the Nelsons themselves about this iconic spot and the ranching life. And be sure to backcast to catch the last episode of the Destination Angler on the Menominee River in northern Wisconsin. This may just be the best smallmouth fishery you've never heard of. Give it a listen and see for yourself as my guest Tom Landwehr dials us into this amazing fishery and explains why Dave Whitlock and Lefty Cray made annual treks up here for many, many years. And be sure to hit that subscribe button to catch all the Destination Angler episodes coming your way. And today our destination is Jackson Hole, Wyoming and the famed Snake River. And our guests are expert fly anglers, teachers, and world-renowned fly tires, Scott Sanchez and Howard Cole, with JD High Country Outfitters, an iconic fly shop right in the heart of Jackson, Wyoming. If you could pick a perfect spot to open a fly shop, Jackson Hole just might be at the top of the list. The number and variety of fishing opportunities in this area are astounding, not to mention the scenery. From casting large attractor foam flies to eager native cutthroat trout on the Snake River and its many tributaries, to matching the hatch on technical spring creeks, to casting to lunker lake trout on some of the most beautiful lakes in the world, you'll find water to suit just about any angler, all nestled under the beauty of the Grand Tetons. Hard to imagine a more perfect spot. A little bit about Scott and Howard. Scott has written hundreds of articles and several books on fly tying and fly fishing and has received many industry accolades, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Federation of Fly Fishers. He's considered one of the most innovative fly tires in the world. Originally from Wisconsin, Howard started fly fishing in the early 70s, has been running premier fly shops in this area now for over 30 years. He's a wealth of knowledge in all aspects of fly fishing and fly tying and regularly shares what he knows at seminars and expos around the West. Many of Howard's patterns have been published in a variety of fly fishing and fly tying books, and he's also an avid steelheader. So kick back and relax a little bit as we talk to these two industry icons about fly fishing and fly tying in one of America's best destinations. So Scott and Howard, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, really excited to be talking about Jackson Hole. My goodness, what a mecca. So I got to start by asking, how long have you guys known each other? Uh, when did we work first since, together? Since here? 88. Yeah. We, oh, really? When we, okay. When there was Jack Dennis. We both work in here together. I'd been here for a while, and then Howard worked here for a bit. Yeah. Okay, long time. And Scott, you have been in the fly fish fishing industry all of your life, and I'm just wondering, how long have you been in Jackson? Got here in 84. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. What were you doing when you first got out here? Well, how I kind of got here... Uh, I grew up in Salt Lake, born and raised, and uh, I was working for Sunset Sporting Goods, which is the big sporting goods chain at the time. Okay. I'd broken up with a long-term girlfriend, and it's like perfect time. The guy I work with called me up and says, I need somebody who knows hunting, fishing, and skiing. You're interested. You got a place to live. It's like, shoot, why not? <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, came here, didn't leave. Well, I actually left a little bit in the middle, but always came back. Okay. Yeah, and, there, and of course, there was a girlfriend involved, always. But yeah, first I worked for another sporting goods store, and then I 
came and worked for Jack Dennis, I guess, probably 85, 86. That's when I got in. Okay. Well, good. Well, let's shift gears for a minute and then let's talk about uh, Jackson Hole. And I was, I was doing some reading. I came across this Jackson Hole one fly event where you get, you got to tell me how this works, you guys. You get one fly, you have to fish it, what, all the whole weekend? And it's like not one pattern, but one fly. Do I have that right? And it said that broken hooks can be resharpened. <laughs> yeah. So with the one fly contest, you get one fly per day. I mean, you can keep fishing, but your points don't count. And it's a combination of numbers of fish. Each fish is worth two points. Then you get bonus points for fish over 12 inches, which go kind of exponentially since there's less fish. There's less 20 inch fish than there's 13 inch fish. But it's a right. fun event, and it's pretty much the one of the biggest fundraisers yeah. for trout conservation. I mean, it's oh, you know, grants the Fortune 500 goes fishing. It's not your local TU banquet. <laughs> There's <laughs> lots right? of okay. zeros behind the uh, the fundraising, <laughs> yeah. which is great. Ooh. They raise it. Yeah. How much do you guys raise? God, I wanted. I think just part of the auction alone, without extra other things, was like one hundred fifty thousand. Oh man! I mean, it's it, it's a sniff to kind of money money in a time frame where conservation is not about putting rocks in the stream. There's no water; it's about doing legal work to put water in the stream. Yeah, mm -hmm. and for the most part, I mean, it all stays here relatively local too. Yeah, hey, yeah, that Greater yeah. Yellowstone yeah, area, that, and it's pretty much it. you. They have the monies, and you can apply for a grant. A lot of it actually is government entities yeah. that apply for the grants, but. And then some of it's straight conservation, some's access, but I mean, some of a lot of it's funding that the government can't, entities don't have can't, monies can't do. to do. Or they can't legally done. do it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, interesting. Oh, well, that's great. You guys are doing that. And that's that's been around for a long, long time too, right? Yeah. Was it year 35? Was it 87? Oh, was the first one? I I've been 87, yeah. around for all of them. Even the yeah. one at Livingston, it was up there. Yeah, and, and I read about this convertible fly you invented, Scott. Tell us about that. So since you got one fly, I mean, in the early days, the one fly, everything was on the Snake River. So back in the old days when things were definitely cooler, a typical September, you know, middle of September on the Snake, I mean, there's frost in the bottom of your boat. Those cutthroats are lazy. They don't wake up till later. But the one thing yeah. that can move them is there's a big Clasinia brownstone, it's a nocturnal okay. emerger. So it yeah. had the profile of a big stonefly, but as you get to later in the afternoon, we get like a Hecuba, which is a cousin to a green drake, like a March brown looking size 12, 14 fly. You could trim it down to that or you could fish it intact. So it gave you some versatility rather than just being stuck with one fly. Yeah. It's kind of one of my favorite attractor patterns. I mean, it's a great cutthroat pattern, but I've caught pretty much all the species on it. Yeah. Nice. Now, and you can trim it back? Is that what I understand? Yeah, so it's tied on a standard dry fly hook or like a 1X long hook. And then moose mane tail on the original, uh, kind of like a hair colored dubbing, thread rib. And then like a calf tail trude wing. But use the butts of that to make a wolf wing and then grizzly brown hackle. And now I've got some tricked out ones where... I can snip up, basically I can have a little parachute that has a Chernobyl body on the back and you trip off the Chernobyl body. And I've kind yeah. of done a bunch of different varieties of that. And that's kind of what I, times I fish it, that's what I fish. Nice. And I read about a fly that you invented that you can, you've caught over a hundred fish on one fly. Tell us about that. Well, actually not a fly I invented, but like the, uh, that Hecuba parachute and some different variations on a parachute. I've definitely had people catch a hundred fly fish during the one fly and still have the fly look good. I mean, still be intact. Huh. Lots of glue and like some top secret methods. <laughs> <laughs> that you have on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I think I watch you tie it on but YouTube. Yeah, to tie up, I mean, most, but a lot of people could tie up, you know, Chernobyl or stream with a last a bunch of fish, but I think I'm one of the few guys that can tie a, even a size 16 parachute that will last all day long. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, mine don't last for a hundred fish. I'm not sure they last for a dozen fish. So, but uh, I did notice you use a lot of super glue versus head cement when you're tying your flies. Is well, that? Uh, I mean, it's use a discreet amount, you know. And people always could tell me, like, well, then the glue weigh down your flies is like the heaviest thing you have on your on your hook is your thread. If you can use less thread wraps, your float flies will float better. But it's a smear of glue. 
but I mean, better live through the chemicals, you know? Yeah, right. So when you're tying, you're, you're, you're constantly, there's little spots where you're stopping and putting a little glue in there, maybe a little half itch in there or something just to keep them together, huh? Yeah. For one fly flies, you're definitely doing that, you know, for my everyday flies, I don't get quite as uptight about it. But yeah, for one fly flies. Okay. And I break test hooks, you know, I've kind of find different hooks that are stronger than others for using. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. This sounds like a cool event. So Jackson Hole, man, you guys have some pretty incredible fly fishing out there. I mean, the snake, but a whole bunch of other ones. Can 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 you guys even begin to describe why this area is such a mecca for fly anglers? I mean, the first thing that both of us would say, I think, is it's fishing for native cutthroats and beautiful surroundings on public land. Yeah. And those three in combination are pretty hard to come by three. anymore. Yeah, the, the three points that I bring out to people is uh, number one you are fishing for uh, not only wild fish but you're fishing for native fish we don't have rainbow trout brown trout brook trout and the such you know uh, what happened there was back in the 50s the late 50s whatever we had two young uh, fish biologists for Wyoming Game and Fish come they saw that they had an intact fishery Uh, not to say that it hadn't been stocked in the past but uh uh, they stopped all stocking at that time of other species. And there's, you can go into detail why brown trout rainbows don't do well here, even if they did or whatever, but it uh, doesn't much matter. There's very few places in lower 48 that you can actually go to a place and, you know, other species that haven't been introduced or, you're, you know, get a mixed stock. And then the other thing is, is that we're, when the, you know, runoff is done and the season really kicks in, we're a dry fly fishery but we're in a tractor dry fly fishery. We don't do a lot of matching the hatch in that sense. We're using relatively larger attractor patterns um, and we're enticing the fish up. We're not looking for rising fish or anything. We're basically nymph fishing with a dry fly. You know, good holding water should be a fish there, cover it well, four or five casts, you know, and, if, and don't be afraid to move the fly around. You know, just, you know, what I'll do is I'll make three, four, I'll make as many casts as to an area that I know that if fish was there, had to see it, then I'm going to go back and make two or three, uh, maybe even forecast purposely moving the fly. Uh, so when it gets into that zone, I'm going to give it a little skitter or something like that. And some days that can be key. Okay. So that's, that's pretty cool, cool there where, you know, you get to fish, you know, four X, three X, you know, size eight fly is not necessarily a big fly for us. Sizes are coming down though with more and more pressure, than yeah. that. but uh, smaller. Yeah. And then the last thing is, is, you know, the Snake River, just as you alluded to, is our main river or whatever. And, you know, the Yellowstone area has tremendous amount of blue ribbon, awesome fisheries, whatever. But the other thing that we have is that we have six major tributaries in the valley that go to the snake. Uh, They all go through a little bit of different topography, but they, they all have a little different look and whatever, but they all fish the same way. So and and again, with those attractor patterns. And then on top of that, all of them have relatively good access, road access uh, for a portion of them. Some of them, you know, full length uh, of them. And uh, nice. uh, and then there's tributaries to those tributaries. So you can fish pretty much any size water you want. And, um, you know, over 97 percent of land, Teton County is public. So there's a lot of public access to all that stuff. So it makes this quite a bit different than in a lot of other places. Right. Teton Park, you got uh, Richard Teton National Forest, and you got BLM mix. Yeah. Yeah, endless. Hi, everybody. This is JP from JP Ross Fly Rods. We're happy to support Steve and sponsor the Destination Angler podcast. Do us a favor and check us out on our website, smallstreamflyfishing.com. JP Ross Fly Rods and Company has been around since 1997. We've made thousands of fly rods with one purpose, helping you get outside and be happy. So check out our line of small stream fly rods like our Muir 7-foot, 5-piece, 3-weight e-glass, our famous Beaver Meadow series of rods starting at 5-foot, 2-weight, and don't forget our 6.5-foot, 3-weight, 4-piece, and now our new Beaver Meadow S-glass, 6.5-foot, 2-weight, 3-weight, all the way up to 8-foot, 5-weight, all in four piece. Check us out, please, at smallstreamflyfishing.com. And thanks a lot for listening. 
We'll see you on the water. So what are some of those, uh, those tributaries, those six tributaries? What are those? Well, starting from the south would be the salt, uh, and then working our way upstream uh, would be the salt, the grays, the Hoback, the Grovant, the Buffalo, yeah. and Pacific Creek. The Buffalo. Okay. Yeah. Can, can we j- just take a minute or two and talk about each of those? Just give us a little bit of the character of the water. Well, salt's a little bit different starting at the bottom where it does have a, uh, it is much more influenced, uh, you know, by Spring Creek type stuff and like that. So it does fish a little bit different than uh, the other ones. Uh, you know, things are m- a little bit more stable. Uh, we don't have big fluctuate as big of fluctuations, let's put it that way, as we do in our other streams because the other stuff, so everything is freestone runoff. And that kind of goes through a lot of agricultural area, but it does have a lot of access. Back in the 60s, uh, Wyoming Game and Fish uh, purchased a lot of public access down there. So uh, nice. a lot of that. Uh, then the next one is- say the, On the salt too, there's the caveat that people that aren't familiar with Wyoming is if a landowner owns land on both stream, on sides of the stream, they own the stream bottom. So there is access to the salt, but you can't walk up and down great lengths of it. Right. So there's a little more confined there, but there's a ton of access. Yeah. Okay. So then the next one is the Hoback, which kind of goes through. Grays. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, it would be the Grays. And that kind of, that's all Forest Service. That's so it's all access. Um, 50, 60 miles. Well, 107 wow. miles long <laughs> the road goes. Yeah. Um, and that kind of goes in between two mountain ranges. I mean, it's it's spectacular. Yeah, and then the next one would be the whole back, and that goes through a canyon, and the highway goes right alongside the whole length of it there. So there's pullouts and turnouts all over the place. So you can just... Probably 15 miles of roadside access. Yeah, yeah, you just pull over and look at it. If you like it, go fish it. If you don't, you know, just move on to your next spot. Um, then Grovant. Grovant you can, I mean, Grovant, you got different sections of it. The very bottom end is on private stuff below Highway 89, but then you have a section through Grand Teton National Park. Probably the biggest campground in the area is the Grovant Campground is located on that. And there's another private section. And then once you get above Grovant River Ranch and into the uh, canyon, almost all of it is public land with the Forest Service. So a place that people can camp and fish and hike and mountain bike ride yeah. and there's a couple little in holdings in there but it's pretty obvious like goose wing yeah. and uh right i mean it's a huge road i mean it can be rugged yeah. sometimes you know definitely want to have a vehicle with some clearance and some uh yeah. suspension to yeah. it but really pretty area some great red hills gray hills lavender hills area nice and buffalo Next one, that's it's a, the Buffalo and the Hoback is the nemesis of the valley. Those are the ones uh, because uh, Buffalo is, you know, basically 30 some miles above town. Hoback is, you know, 15 miles below town. So if we get rain in those, those can go out. So the upper river can, the snake can go out because of the Buffalo. And then the lower river uh, can go out because of the Hoback, just depending, but you know, that doesn't mean both of them can get rain at the same time. So, but those are the nemesis and those can put the river, Snake River out probably the most out of all the tributaries. Okay. And the same thing, there's a lot of starts in the park or, you know, it enters into the snake in Teton, in Teton National Park, it goes ways. Then there's some private stuff. Uh, but then again, as it goes back on in, it goes all the way back to a, a trailhead and, uh, you know, then that's all Forest Service all the way back there. Man. And then the next one right above that is Pacific Creek. Yeah. And the lower part of that is basically like a little mini snake. I mean, it's all spread out and yeah. kind of going through a deal. Um, and that's the first one. That's the first tributary during a runoff season that will clear. Uh, and it oh, okay. fish, fish quite well. The uh, difference is it's the very first one that, uh, goes out though too I mean, that it, it drops down to such a low level and other things start to pick up that you know you should probably okay. probably fish some of the other waters instead of picking on those fish that are okay in that low water it's helpful to understand the the native cutthroats and how they survived and why they're here rather than rainbows and browns that got planted at different times 
these fish are super migratory. It's a fish that's perfectly adapted. Uh, I mean, it's a fish literally that can go through six months of winter, three months of runoff, and three months of summer. And it does that by migrating. You don't mm. have to think of cutthroats as migratory fish. Right. Right now, almost all the fish are in the Snake River, and a lot of them are south of town. It's bigger, deeper thermal water. Yeah. And the windows on the smaller streams, a lot of cases, especially for the bigger fish, is when runoff starts, they start moving up, and they'll get in there, and late June, early July, you can catch the outside fish. But then as you get to August, September, and the water levels drop, they'll migrate back down the snake. So it's this up and down migration. And Interesting. That also affects which fisheries are at their peak or not. Right. You know, which yeah. ones are fishbowl. Right. We talked about Pacific Creek. Those are based. Those bigger fish are spawning fish, no doubt about it, either on the way up or way down. Yeah, and that's, that's what I alluded to earlier. I mean, we can get into the, the logistics of, you know, how the system works or whatever I, what I was talking earlier. But that's there's very little spawning activity and spawning gravels and such in the snake river itself and so how these fish have learned to survive just what scott alluded to is when that fall time comes we get down to wintertime flows whatever those the tributaries still have resident fish but uh, the majority of those fish move out and move into the snake and they'll winter over into the snake and that's when people come and they want to winter fish and stuff. And we you know, like stick with the snake, trust me, because <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. where they are. Yeah. And then and then, as Scott said, as the springtime comes and those flows start to, you know, bump up or whatever, they're going to move out of the snake. They're going to run up into those tributaries to spawn. So mm -hmm. they're going to stay there. Uh, life's good. There's no sense of you know leaving there. And then as the fall comes and those tributaries start to drop, and become low, then they're going to run, start moving back to the snake. And that's, again, that's why the snake can be a great, the snake river itself can be a great fall fishery because uh, a lot of those fish have moved from the tributaries into the snake itself. And don't get me wrong, like I said, there's still resident fish in the, in, in the tributaries, but not to the extent of, uh, of the would be earlier in the season. I see. So what are the fish looking for in the winter? Looking for deep, slower water? Is that why they're moving down in the snake? Yeah, insulated water. Yeah. Okay. Like the, the Hoback Canyon, I mean, during the winter, rarely gets, I mean, hardly gets any light at all. So you got a lot of shelf ice, uh, can actually freeze over. You got a lot of anchor ice, cold, cold, cold water temperatures. And uh, so, yeah, those fish are. Yeah, it's already farming this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, super interesting. And then you've got this uh, this creek called uh, Flat Creek, right? That's just a, it fishes a little differently than the rest of these. Do I have that right? Well, yeah. it depends on where. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you okay. got the you got the headwaters, which is a uh, small pocket water. Take your two way, crawl around, fish for little cutthroats, and there's some brook trout there. And then the section people think about the most is the National Elk Refuge. And that would be August 1st to the end of October fishery. And it's probably one of the best public spring creeks. And, and in all actuality, it's not, e it's not even a spring creek. It starts out as a freestone uh, creek. And as it enters into the elk refuge, it goes subterranean and then pops back on up out of there. So when it pops back on up, then it acts like a spring creek through there. And it can be some of the most demanding fishery uh, that you that you want to be involved with. Uh, yeah. That when people come in and say, "Oh, those dumb cutthroats," they, I love to say, "Okay, well, here, go on out there, come back, and tell me how dumb they <laughs> come are." Come back yeah. in an hour You'll or two. <laughs> yeah, uh, it fishes a little bit like Silver Creek in the standpoint that it is, you know, smaller water, and uh, there's really no place for the fish to go. So they become very, very wary of their surroundings, uh, of your casting. You know, make your. It's one of those where you're much better off sitting. I mean, and the, and the deal is for most of us locals, we're going out there to, to dry fly fish. We're finding a face and we're trying to feed it, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you can nymph fish, you can streamer fish, whatever. But uh, the, main, the main people really, I mean, that's a dry fly situation, technical dry fly fishing um, and trying to, and, and you'll do much better just by sitting, if you find a fish, sit and watch him for a little bit just to see if, he, if he's moving, how he's moving, how he's reacting, and then study your situation on how you want to approach it. Uh, I remember one fish one time that was sitting out a fair amount away from the bank because they can get really, really tight into the bank. 
And he was sitting out. And I'm going like, you know, you should be taken out of the gene pool. I'm going like, this is going to be too, <laughs> too easy. And uh, watch this. So I just went up and made a cast, and the fly come down, and it got about six, eight inches in front of him, and caught a current and just dragged it on out of there. And you couldn't get a fly to that fish from that position because it would do that. When as soon as you start dragging the fly, now it's war. It's, uh, they, uh, it, huh. it's, it's a different deal. So yeah. uh, just study your situation and how you want to approach it. You'll probably catch, catch more fish than you will just jumping in and getting after it. It's kind of slow down and position. And it has much more consistent hatches than the rest oh, of the yeah. water here. Yeah. So you yeah. kind of start out August 1st with gray drakes, although they're usually a little bit smaller than what people think for gray drakes, PMDs. You can have green drakes too, depending yeah. on the year. And then yeah. kind of move into mahoganies and then finally into bloomings at the end. You're kind of your yeah. main hatches. Can and then terrestrials. No, that's beetles. That's hoppers. Back in the day, it used to be a, a very, very good hopper fishery too, but it's the uh, last bunch of years, hoppers haven't been, I mean, you still catch a fish or two on a hopper, but it, it hasn't been as good. There's fewer hoppers or just smarter fish? Uh, I, I think, think it's smarter fish. I think it's a combination. <laughs> combination <laughs> okay. there of, uh, you know. So Flat Creek, you are matching the hatch and you're oh, getting totally, yeah, totally. small flies and it's Spring Creek fishing. Okay. And then down below town, there's another elk refuge down there that it runs through and then it enters into the snake down there. And and that can be, that's a real nice early season situation because the water clears early down there. Not a big fish fishery for the most part, but I mean, it's water when the rest of us, you know, rest of the waters can be in runoff. Uh, yeah. That, that can, that can be, and that, that under, you know, the upper, upper flat and lower flat, um, those run on uh, uh, general regulations. Okay. Okay. The reason why it opens August 1st out there, because there's, uh, protecting that spawning situation on the, on the elk refuge. Yeah, and then waterfowl too. Young yeah. of the year waterfowl. Yeah, that's what uh, that's what the refuge says. Okay, so it sounds like there's a lot of good reasons to stop by your shop. It it sounds like these these streams can be full of cutthroat, but then you know certain times of the year the the fish have moved out and moved around, and uh, it sounds like people ought to be stopping by and finding out you know what's fishing well. And there's also May and early June, and like you should just go tarpon fishing. <laughs> you know, I mean, our, our runoff is much later than a, than so many other areas, yeah. and like we have one of the longest runoffs in North America. You know. Interesting. Yeah, when you said August first opening, that's well, that's because of spawning though. But that's, that's spawning, yeah, really and the, the <laughs> refuge says it's my migratory birds too. But uh, okay. But, you know, if, if there is normal anymore, you know, typically our runoff will start about third week of April and go to the last week of June, first week of July. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. That is a long one. So we're a late season. We're a late season fishery. Yeah. And you've got some really fantastic lakes fishing too, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, people don't think about it as much in the fly fishing world. I mean, there's, there's 50 pound lakers in Jackson Lake. I mean, there's 30 pound fish and yeah. Jenny and Phelps for sure, but, wow. but you've never caught a lake trout on a fly. I mean, it's one of the easiest areas to catch them. And a lot of that, you know, that timing thing, I've actually fished Jenny Lake one year, May 21st, and iced off May 20th. So, I mean, the stuff's a little bit later, but that kind of mid May through June. When the rivers are high, yeah, it can be some great lake oh, fishing. Oh yeah, during I our, mean, I mean that's that's you know that's our best time of year to fish the lakes because you know like you say, I always kind of say around May tenth is when ice comes off right in there a little bit, some little this, this way or that way, and when that ice comes off, you know the fish are relatively high in the water column, relatively close yeah. to, to the shoreline, so you don't even need a need a boat or anything like that, and uh, and you don't need sinking lines. Uh, yeah. As the season progresses, you know, a sink tip or a f full sink, uh, you know, type three or something like that might be a benefit to you. But uh, sure. um, so that that really helps during our runoff. That that's a great option to fish the lake. Right. The, the most popular hikes in the Tetons too are to the lower elevation lakes. Yeah. You know, Bradley, Taggart, Phelps, Lee, Bear Paw Trapper. You can combine fishing with hiking. You know, so if you have a hiking crowd, but you need to fish, you can kind of justify it, mix it up a bit. Yeah. And, and does it get crowded? Is it worth doing some hiking to get away from the crowds? For the lake fishing? 
Yeah, lake fishing and then rivers as well. Rivers, I would say, we've got so much water. I'm not saying you're not going to see people, but you never really have too big of a problem of finding your, you know, your comfort area to fish. Now, Flat Creek on the Elk Refuge, that's a little bit different because it is limited, you know, area. Um, and it is just like Scott said, basically our only really public Spring Creek um, and people do come from all over and around the world, actually, to come fish that uh, at that time or whatever. So, but most of the time out there, you know, you know, fishing ethics are, are pretty good. Um, you don't really have too much of a problem. People give space. They see you fishing to fish. They're going to give you plenty of space to walk around or whatever. But the, the rest of our river system, I mean, we just got so much water, it just spreads everybody out. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Hey, who doesn't love a good story? We all do, right? Well, lately, we're getting a lot of people giving us an email or a phone call telling us about how much they love small stream fly fishing. Well, it just so happens that we make small stream fly rods. This is JP of JP Ross Fly Rod Company. You can find us at smallstreamflyfishing.com. We want to hear your story, and we want to set you up with the best small stream fly rod you can imagine. Go to the website, contact us, tell us your story. We're going to hook you up with a small stream fly rod at a great price made here in the United States. Well, let's talk about the just the history of the area a little bit. Uh, so I read that there used to be hotels and gas stations along Jenny Lake. I can't even imagine that. But, uh, you know, talk about some of the older days and, uh, and when did Jackson really kind of start to flourish? I mean, has well, started- well, let's go back to this. Why, you know, a lot of people come in and, you know, is it, is it Jackson or is it Jackson Hole? Right. You know, Jackson is the town, the whole area, basically, you know, which lies between two kind of mountain ranges. You know, the Tetons, very predominant on the western side, is, comes from the mountain man time. Uh, what they called these areas were, were holes. Yep. Uh, that lie in between the two mountain areas uh, on both sides. And Davy Jackson was the mountain man guy that kind of was, this was his area. So that's why it was called Jackson's Hole. So that's how that goes. So but most of the traffic uh, historically in the olden days, you know, back to Native Americans was a, it was a summer hunting ground. A lot of stuff was summer based. And then she started getting a few settlers, ranchers in. People living here around, not a year-round economy by any means. And then somebody figured out in the 20s, 30s range about dude ranches. And that's kind of where the tourism took off. I mean, there's a bunch of dude ranches actually in the park that are, you can see it's a historical Barbie C and then the white grass and a few of those. And that's kind of after that when uh, stuff was starting to get overrun. Yeah, there was hotels and gas stations along Jenny Lake and the uh, Rockefeller saw that and actually had the finances and was able to buy that, which apparently wasn't super popular with the ranch yeah, community right. here, but they well, donated it to the American people. It, it kind of was at the beginning when people were selling, but then they kind of ended up finding out because the, the Rockefellers kept it pretty hush-hush what was going on, but then when it started getting found out what was happening there, yeah, it, it wasn't well received in the, in the neighborhood let's put it that way uh, interesting they wanted yeah. to graze in the park yeah. they couldn't yeah right but they but they they basically saved the area and then they pushed geez for a long time to get it made into a national park and you know when it when it first started it was it was maybe not even half the size that it is now okay uh and then as Things kept expanding. I mean, obviously, the Rockefellers didn't buy all that property, but if things expanded, you know, then the park is is at its size now. Yeah. It, it, talk, talk about the National Elk Refuge. Like, that. how did that come about? I mean, from what I understand, it was elk, I mean, there's always been an elk winning area. I mean, basically, my house is an elk winning area. And huh. people saw the elk populations going down. A lot of it had to do with winter habitat. Right. And so that's how it started. You know, and it became part of the... U.S. Fish and Wildlife, which, I mean, a lot of those U.S. Fish and Wildlife locations were really started by it was formerly the Ducks Unlimited, you know, across the country. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, they had some severe winter kills of of the elk herd, whatever, and that's when they started saying, you know, like, we need to help these guys out or whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure as people moved in and stuff like that, that changed a little bit of the habitat or migration routes and things like that. 
But, uh, you know, the elk refuge now, it's not uncommon to see in the wintertime, what, it's got seven to 9,000 elk out there. Yeah. Somewhere wow. in that, that range. No kidding. If you come in the wintertime, it's pretty cool to go out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I bet. You're right, you're right amongst them, and you're, there'll be bald eagles and wolves. <laughs> yeah. Oh, bison. really? Yeah. Bison, yeah, went out there. Uh, that's cool. Do you guys, uh, did you see many grizzly bears? Uh, probably not in town. But. We don't, we see them downtown. We don't see them out in the woods. <laughs> no, we, I mean, they, that population's done pretty well. That famous 399 under four cubs actually walked through the uh, I show, sheriff's parking lot like about a month, about a month, kind of wasn't that long ago. It was like a month ago. A month ago? Oh, yeah. Really? yeah. I thought you were talking about the grizzly bears, the guys that were asking to put the mask on. <laughs> they get they get pretty grizzly bear. <laughs> but what no, they do for population oh, for the COVID thing yeah. in the shop. When we ask somebody to put a mask on, they get some of them get pretty grizzly. Oh, I get you. Okay, I get you. And and so Jackson's kind of uh, a town where you see a lot of some famous folks out there. Like, doesn't Yvonne Chenard live out there, and a few other yeah. folks? Do you see some of those guys? You see them in the shop buying fly tying stuff. I mean, yeah. Harrison Ford is a uh, it's full time resident, yeah, you know, a lot of he's pretty regular movie stars. Uh, okay, normal uh, people, huh? Saudi Arabia has a place at the <laughs> Teton Village. All right, well, they got to live somewhere, don't they? Yeah, <laughs> very good. And you worked for uh, Dan Bailey for a while too, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, I spent 94 95 in Austin, Texas. Uh, worked at the Austin Angle as the first Scott fly rod rep in Texas. And I was actually doing consulting work for Dan Bailey's on the flies, basically a fly designer. And uh, when my wife was writing her thesis, John Bailey called me up about doing the wholesale manager thing. So okay. I was there for like seven years and got back to Jackson 2002. Okay. Very good. And tell me about some of these books you've written. So the first one was a uh, new generation of trout flies. And I ran into Tom Peril. There's a publisher at a party at Greg Thomas's house in Ennis, Montana, the Ennis Fly Fishing Festival. And he asked me to do a book. And that's a book about the the flies I've kind of come with over the years fishing in the greater Yellowstone area. And then the, actually, that was the second book, I should say. The first one was uh, Introduction to Saltwater Fly Tying. And I wrote it because there was nothing about saltwater fly tying. Okay. As far as how to do it, there's lots of recipe books, and uh, I did that with Jim Pruitt. And then book number three is I wanted to do something different than just fly time because I've done, you know, two fly time books, then basically lots of articles. So I did uh, The Never Ending Stream, which is a book about the people and the flies that influenced me, more of a coffee table book and a tribute. And I did the uh, text, the photos, and the illustrations in that one. It was kind of fun. Yeah, nice, nice. And Howard, how about you? How long have you been in uh, Jackson, in the Jackson Hole area? Yeah, I lived right in Jackson since '88. I moved here. At, at, okay. And that that's uh, that first year or so that Scott and I worked together at uh, uh, JD, you know, Jack Dennis, whatever. And then uh, had an opportunity of a good friend of mine that him and I guided had been guiding together a little bit, Mike Atwell. Him and I had been talking a little bit, and he went from guiding into repping, and then I was over here. He kind of knew I wanted to expand what I did and called me up and said, like, hey, uh, I might have a gig for you, but you, you're you going to have to move a little bit. And I said, well, how far do I have to move? He said, oh, about a block. <laughs> there, was <laughs> okay. a, there was another fly shop, High Country Flies, that Jimmy Jones owned. He said, you should go over and talk to him whatever and uh so i did and so then anyway jimmy and i got together and then uh moved on with high country flies whatever and then uh getting here was kind of a crazy deal whatever i had been i had come to uh be a ski well i didn't know i was gonna be a ski bum i was being a ski bum <laughs> in the late 70s here in jackson and uh anyway i'd had this one i knew one person in california that always bugged me about coming to California. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So I said, okay, you know, it started to become March and I wasn't really too much for spring skiing. So I said, well, I'll go to California and uh, come back here in, in May, you know, whatever. So uh, anyway, I went there and 
nine years went by. <laughs> no man. And in, in the meantime, I'd, I had been coming out in the summertime and guiding and, and teaching fly fishing schools and stuff with, with Andy Puyon's uh, fly fishing seminars. And uh, then I'd come out in the wintertime to ski. And in the meantime, I got, I, I did get married in California or whatever. And my wife, she always got to come out and do all the fun stuff. And I was always saying like, well, we're moving to Jackson. We're moving to Jackson. And finally one day she said, cause I was always, she was from California, so she didn't know how to drive in snow. She didn't know, you know, it's different when it's 20 below and say, I don't think I'll go skiing today compared to this 20 below and I got to go to work. So uh, yeah. anyway, one day she said like, are we moving or not? And I said, well, that's it. Boom. <laughs> and we left, we left in April, April of that year then to come live in Jackson. Oh my gosh. I bet she's liking the, the winter weather so far this season, right? You guys have had kind of a mild start. Pretty, pretty yeah. mild. Yes. Yeah. And Scott, did you were doing some midge fishing just a little while ago? Is that right? Yeah, about a week and a half ago. I mean, like in between hunting seasons and not skiing, which I'd normally at least be Nordic skiing by now, and went out to take the dog out one afternoon, just get the old dog out, and like there's fish on top, and might as well fish to him, and went back a couple of days later, and they were in the same spot, eating in the foot two feet of water and completely slack water like it was really? October. Yeah, oh, which is not man. normal. Normal that it was done three weeks ago, and then it got warm. Right, right. And did you get a nice one? I heard you did. Oh, I mean, I got a nice rainbow on the south fork in between, swinging the baby spay with leeches. I got like twenty three inch rainbow. Woo! Nice man. Not bad for uh, was it November, December, huh? December. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shoot. I just got back from uh, last week. I just got back from. Oregon, the Oregon, Idaho border. I was in Hell's Canyon, steelhead, steelhead fishing, and uh, yeah, the first two days over there it was sixty-five degrees. Oh, so man. That, that would have been December second and third, whatever. Okay, how was the fishing, Howard? Yeah, you know, I still had a fair amount, and you know, I've been going to uh, British Columbia since nineteen ninety, and this is the third year since then I haven't gone to BC. You know, last year we couldn't get in. This year, just when I would have been going up there, the Skeena system closed because of, basically because of no fish. Uh, so these last two years, I've been messing around over on that Oregon, Idaho, uh, Washington border. And, you know, this year they were really saying the, the runs were really, really going to be poor, which they've been bad in these last bunch of years. But I actually had a pretty good season. And, yeah, I had uh, this last deal over there in Hell's Canyon – it was better than okay and almost good. Let's put it that no, way. How about that? But I mean, I caught all wild fish too. That was that was kind of cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah, good to hear. Those still had are running. Kind of back on the history of Jacks and kind of the the next step and the evolution was the uh, ski area. Yeah, ski area. Ski area is kind yeah. of what turned this into a year round location. Before that, I mean, we had the small ski area, at Snow King, but that was sixty seven. And that's kind of when the, the next changes kind of came, I would mm -hmm. say. Nice. Good place to be. Well, let's shift gears and talk about the Snake River. Can you guys uh, try to put into words, you know, why is it considered, you know, the crown jewel, right? Why is it such a special spot? I mean, it's a gorgeous spot with gorgeous fish and big dry flies. Just like we said earlier, it's kind of the appeal. And then there's just tons of public access. I mean... The Snake River starts out in, you know, Yellowstone Park and flows down. So there's public access there for hiking in. There's some roadside access. Goes the Rockefeller Parkway into Jackson Lake, which is a natural lake with a dam put on it for Idaho irrigation. You got Teton Park and then public lands and the ranch lands in the Columbia River, but Palisades Reservoir is kind of what we think as, of as the end of the Upper Snake River. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know, 30 some miles south, south of Jackson itself. So there's, you know, from Jackson Lake Dam down to uh, Palisades, well, to Alpine, but uh, almost 50 miles, 40 some miles yeah. in the water. I mean, kind yeah. of. Tell you what the kind of the basic boat launches accesses yeah. are from the top. So if we look Jackson Lake Dam kind of as the starting point, 
I mean, as soon as you got the stuff there in Yellowstone and Rockefeller Parkway, but you got access right below the dam. A lot of people like going there. Uh, it's the only place where you can fish bait is the first thousand feet. So that's kind of like a lot of it with the families here, you know, coming, coming here, we'll go there. There's okay. access to the wormhole. Pacific Creek is the second boat launch. Dam boat launch is kind of a boat launch, but not really. So that's probably five miles. The next one, Dan, would be Dead Man's Bar. And then you got Moose Landing, which is Moose, right by Miner's Ferry. So those are in the National Park and Teton Park. Uh, then it's Wilson Bridge, which yeah. is the road, Highway 22, going out to Wilson, Teton Pass. And that's the closest access to, to Jackson. It's about five miles west of town. And that one's probably got the the easiest walking access. There's two miles totally. upstream on the east side and three miles downstream on the west side. Yeah. Right. And that, it's like a default easement. I mean, technically it's private property, but from you see it just become there's, public. There's uh, uh, dikes that run up and down both sides of the river that the Army Corps, pushed, I think, started putting in in the 50s and then have added two on and off over the years and whatever. But so it's really, really easy access. You can get on top of the dikes and just walk and kind of, you know, the river might be right next to you. Then it goes away from you goes, but you can kind of see like, Oh, geez, that looks pretty good. So you can just head on over there. Lots of people there, but most of the people are not fishing. They're walking their dogs or riding their bikes. They're going for a hike, whatever, just because they can stay on top of the dikes. And uh, so great access. And, South Park is the next one downstream, and that one would be south of town. So basically, you're heading hunt down Highway 89, about five miles south of town. And then uh, after that, you got Astoria, Pritchard, Elbow, East Table, West Table, Sheep Gulch. From West Table down is the Whitewater section. Yeah. It's about okay. class three. But there's a lot of different variety of water in that section of the canyon. As long as you're gutty enough to walk down a hill, there's tons of access yeah. down there. And yeah. probably that's less pressure down there in reality. Yeah. Okay, down in the canyon. Yeah. yeah. And I'm I'm curious, so so you just ticked off some of these, I guess these are major sections. You know, what um like what's the water like when you're up closer to Jackson Lake. I mean, you've been talking about some braided water. The water spreads out. Say more about that. Yeah, basically from Jackson Lake down to uh, um, in between Moose and Wilson is where the dikes start. So above that dike section, the river braids. It's a pretty much a natural, natural river there. So it braids and channels and becomes. And again, there uh, it can be some great wade fishing. But again, you kind of have to want it because, you know, there's no roads or anything like that. So you're going to have to do your hiking um, up and down the river or whatever. But the river braids and channels so you can find those little side channels. So it makes it very conducive to wade fishing. Yeah. And then, you know, th then that dike section makes it very because it just has great access. And then, you know, uh, right at South Park, there's the river braids and, you know, above above the South Park Bridge and takeout. Uh, the river braids and channels there. Um, and then again, that's part of the, the elk refuge down there where uh, Flat Creek comes into the snake. Um, so there's great wade fishing there too, if, if you wanted to. Um, okay. And then, then there's a lot of private stuff from there down to uh, Astoria. And then past Astoria, you get into the real canyon there. And then just like as Scott alluded to, if you're willing to go down, you know, uh, do some walking, go down into, get into the river. I mean, you got to scramble across some rocks. But once you get down there, there can be some really good fishing down in there, wade fishing too. Okay. There's a lot of people just think that, you know, it's it's all a, a float situation, which is good. There's no doubt about that. I mean, floating floating really helps uh, in, in some instances because, you know, by hiking, the difference is, is going from good area to good area. You know, you're burning up time where if you can float and get the spot to spot and you might as well might as well be fishing along the way, you know, so. And get a little help from a guide along the way. Yeah. So yeah. It, and it's uh, with with these big attractor flies, uh, it sounds like it might be a, a good river for beginners. Oh, it's totally great. novice river. Totally. And it's entry level. Awesome. And it's 
Huh. Probably one of the better places realistically for a novice to catch a better size fish. Yeah. Because they're not fishing a size 20 midge, you know, so right. beyond their capability. And the fact that these fish do like moving flies, a lot of that has to do not with being stupid. It just that's what their food does. Yeah. The uh moves around. Big Chernobyl skating, we got that Klicini, that brownstone that the male only has half a wing, so it runs across the water if it gets stuck on there. That's a perfect imitation. A lot of the caddis are pretty active bugs, so it's they're eating what they were seeing. Yeah. So by being a freestone runoff system, we don't have real deep hatches, you know, like, you know, we don't have necessarily, you know, a, a, you know this blanket thing of PMDs coming down. You might have four or five different bugs coming, you know, at the same time sporadically through there. So the fish become up very opportunistic. And so that's why, you know, why on a tractor pattern, it might have attributes of this, that, this, uh, Scott's convertible, perfect example. Could be this, could be that, could be, you know, like a Chernobyl you know, or Chubby or something like that. Could be that stonefly, could be a hopper uh, moving around, could even be like a crane fly, you know, so... Again, the, the fish, uh, they need to be, you know, pretty opportunistic. Okay. Howard, I'm wondering, you grew up in Wisconsin, and uh, the, the secret there in Wisconsin is you got to move that fly to do well out there. And I wonder if, if some of that came with you to uh, – some of that uh, knowledge came with you. Well, you got to realize I've lived here longer than I lived in Wisconsin. Is that right? Yeah, oh, a long yeah. time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah a lot longer. <laughs> We did some, I did a show on the Driftless and it, it's all about fly movement out there. Yeah. Uh, back in, if you fished the Driftless area, you know, I started fishing that in the, in the late sixties, early seventies. Wow. No kidding. And back in those days, I mean, there was nobody, nobody trout fished, you know, that I'll I bet. knew of. Uh, and that's how, how I started kind of fly fishing. Cause I was going like, geez, if I'm fishing for trout, I should be you know using a fly rod. <laughs> so, uh, you know, back in those days, uh, I think when I was doing it, be kind of being kind of entry level, I was probably moving the fly that I didn't even know <laughs> by mistake, so much. dragging it across the water. Hey, I caught a fish. <laughs> but no, I I did a lot of matching the hatch back there then and whatever. Yeah, you got to. Yeah, for sure. I fished once I caught the bug. Then you know because my dad was a musky fisherman, so that's what I kind of grew up. Okay, that was, that was our deal or whatever. So then when I started trout fishing, then all of a sudden I really got the bug and I was all over the state, you know, back in the day, not so many years ago, you know, Wisconsin was rated the third best, you know, uh, trout fishery in the United States. Yeah, I'll bet. Over 10,000 miles of water and stuff. So I fished a lot of the rivers and streams all over the place back then. It's nice to have it, you know, for us Midwesterners, you know, uh, it's nice to have something like Wisconsin in our backyard. Yeah. All right. So um, how is the snake doing from a conservation standpoint? Uh, I think water rights are kind of the big issue out there, aren't they? Not necessarily on this with snake. I mean, it's definitely with the irrigation, uh, you know, from a conservation snake isn't catch and release, but it's close enough to it. You can, and most of the streams here, it's like three fish. Only one can be over 12 inches. What you're trying to do is, you know, protect your primary spawners. The females are, Right, spawn at 11, the males is about 12 inches. So if you're not killing the brood stock, you got a pretty good deal. The smaller fish, it's got like a 97 more percent mortality rate. So that part is good. But uh, I mean, the reality of water in the West is it's rivers or irrigation canals for agriculture to a large degree. So mm -hmm. there's some gentlemen's agreements on that. But I mean, water is going to be the biggest nemesis for the whole West, probably as we if we right. get five years. Uh, kind of. A little bit of background for you there. You know, when I first moved here, I, I really kind of got involved. You know, I've been on the Trout Unlimited board. I don't know what I was on, 12 years, whatever, and really got – when I first started going to the water flow meetings, which they would have in May, first one I went to, there was three fishermen there, myself and two other people. Uh, most of the guys were uh, the rafting companies, be it Whitewater, be it Scenic, whatever, and what they were asking – the bureau wreck for their releases and such was not necessarily what we were looking for. And again, the there's Jackson Lake is it's a very very complex, big system that goes all the way from here all the way over to Twin Falls, Idaho. Yeah. And these are Jackson Lake is the oldest water rights on the system, and they're owned by three water districts over over in um, 
Twin Falls. So that what those guys are going to get water. Uh, it doesn't much matter in between and whatever. So I, even though it moves the furthest, if they need water, whatever, uh, the guys in between are going to be neglected. And uh, those that water is going to go to those guys over there. Since that first meeting I went to, more and more and more uh, fishermen got involved. And uh, then when the Bureau of Rec started hearing some of you know our issues, I mean, back in the day, you know, our season relatively short, July 15th to September 15th, you know, so if they would just, you know, come August, they needed water over there, they just turn it on or, or turn it off, either one, which would, could knock out our season in two weeks, you know, so we started saying, you know, like, you're killing, you know, quarter of our season by doing yeah. that. Oh, well, we didn't know. Oh, da, da, da. So uh, they, the Bureau of Rec really started listening to the fishermen that and and tried to replicate as much as they could a kind of a natural release and and a kind of a even release and they have for quite a few years now the last two years we've been in pretty drought situations uh and uh, this year our system is really i mean as severe as i've seen it since i've lived here uh jackson jackson lake was pulled down to what 13 percent palisades reservoir which is a huge reservoir yeah. Uh, was pulled down to like 7% American Falls, which is monster. That's the biggest system on the, uh, you know, reservoir on the system. And that's, that's huge. I mean, Palisades goes for 26 miles. Um, wow. So getting pulled down to think of that 7%, you basically have a, <laughs> you basically have a natural it's a, uh, it's r- river it's going through there. So. so you say 7% of what? Seven percent of its full of its, its maximum capacity. capacity of its maximum capacity. Yeah, really, it's down to seven percent. Yeah, it was oh pulled down to that. Yeah, that's shocking. Yes. Yeah, and thirteen percent on Jackson Lake. My goodness, that that might be what it looked like before they kind of put the dam in. Yeah, pretty yeah, much. Pretty much. Yeah. Which again, I mean, it's still. I mean, you know, that's a low water dam, and they only raised you know the thirty thirty feet. So Jackson Lake is a natural lake. So I mean. Even though it looked low to a lot of people, it, you know, it's, that's the lowest I've seen. Yeah. I saw it like when they were working on the dam. Yeah, yeah, back in the uh, early yeah. 90s. Okay. Huh. How How is the snake fishing today compared to, you know, like 25 years ago? Oh, it's definitely better. Yeah. I, when they were working yeah. on the dam, there were definitely some major issues. And then one of the – people always think about summer flows. And then, you know, high, low summer flows – Definitely affect the fishery, but they probably affect the fishermen more than the fish. Fish yeah. are fairly adaptable, but getting minimum winter flows by far is the biggest thing in cold totally. climates like that. Totally. Your winter factor, I mean, it's kind of like you're a hunter. You know, basically, winter is your limiting factor on what you can have for wildlife. You know, that's the, I mean, right. the rivers at its lowest capacity, that's its carrying capacity. So, the 285, the 325 CFS coming out of Jackson Lake Dam, that's been probably more important getting that than what exactly what the summer's flows were. Totally, totally. And you just have less housing. There's less yep. places for, for fish to live. Uh, yeah. Conditions are much more severe, so larger fish will go in and dominate, push those juvenile fish out into marginal areas. And, uh, you know, back in... Back when I was really involved with the TU board, you know, uh, our game of fish, uh, uh, John Keefling, uh, you know, it's, it's, we lost 52% of our juvenile fish every year. And that was, be- that was because of the winter flows. Yeah. Then, like I said, uh, Bureau of Rec has really worked with us. You know, when I was on the board, we were pushing for maximum water flows as much as we could get in the wintertime. And we found out there, there's a tipping thing that you can actually have too much. And so then you have frazzle ice and all this coming down that push, again, push fish out of areas, uh, is killing them, just the frazzle ice alone coming down and hitting them. So our optimum flow is about, for winter flows uh, being released out of Jackson Lake, is about 480 to 500 CFS. Okay. And what's frazzle ice? Frazzle ice? Oh, when the water temperature is basically below freezing. So it's moving, so it can't freeze over but it's freezing in the water itself. So you got all this, you know, best way I could say like small candles or whatever coming on down that are all icicles. Oh, interesting. Coming uh, down. Yeah. You know? Fish wouldn't like that. 
those mm. winter flows are also critical for invertebrates. People don't think yep. about that part. You know, basically no food, no fish. And when it's 20, 30 below, I mean, things freeze. And if you get anchor ice, you can lose a lot of invertebrates. So having yeah. a minimum flow helps out with uh, that resource. Right. Well, thanks for all the work you guys are doing. It sounds like uh, years and years of meetings and TU getting involved. And that's fantastic. TU, TU has done a great, great yeah. job. Yeah, I love TU. Wyman Game and Fish. I mean, John Keefling, Ralph Hutherson. John Keefling did this thesis on snake river cutthroats. Yeah. Knew much. John Erickson, Huddleston. Yeah. Yep. Those guys were Rob, very, in, yeah, Rob, Rob Gibson. Rob Those Gibson, guys were Diane, very instrumental uh, yeah. in making sure that this is the fishery it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in some states, some of the, you know, some of the folks that, you know, run these dams, they don't get it, you know, and, and they don't cooperate with the fishermen. You know, they just don't care. So it's great when you get some people that are enlightened like that, you know, that it's a resource that, that all of us can enjoy if we just give it some thought. We got a, we got a new guy, so we got to train him too. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, you're just the yeah. guys to do it, I'm sure. All right. I wanted to ask you guys, before we run out of time here, I, I, I wanted to ask you guys about your fly tying because you guys have invented a bunch of flies that, uh, you know, are kind of world-renowned. I wonder if you guys could talk about those. And then I guess my... My question after that is like, how do you go about inventing a fly? Like, how does that start for you all? Uh, the skies open up and I have a vision. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. I have, I have no idea where the stuff comes from sometimes. Uh, and a lot of it just like you're trying to improve on something or like, I just want to see if this will work. Okay. To try to remedy a situation. I can't sit there. I go through analytical thought completely. It's Scott and I are totally two different flat tires. Yeah. Uh, I, In what I, way? I, you know, because I, I mean, I fish everything, but you know, I fish a lot of technical water uh, for my personal stuff, whatever. So I'm much more, uh, matching the hatch type of stuff and, and that and again the more and more you know about specific insects and life cycles and whatever you start to you know expand upon it I mean most of my patterns uh, I think if you see in the books at least in this book you know mergers and stuff uh, most of my stuff is all pretty much emerging so I, I have some nymph stuff not a whole bunch I uh, don't fish too much nymph fishing okay uh, so yeah mine probably far more analytical than uh, Scott's and again, um, but I, I'm kind of moved into a, you know, I hate to say it, kind of a artsy thing. I got to be in the right mood and everything kind of sit down at the bench and go like, hmm. And after I've tied about three flies, then it's kind of like, well, that's kind of like that, but now I could do this and maybe, oh, I could do that. Oh, let's change this. So, you know, after, so if I'm sitting down for, you know, you know, any length of time, I've, I have, probably three, four different patterns, uh, you know, different, you know, just little okay. different themes and stuff like that. You're tweaking them constantly doing different. Yeah. Slight variations then. And then, and then I think, I think Scott too, I think, don't you, we look at materials and maybe, uh, look at materials in a different way that you could maybe use them, whatever. Yeah. Uh, Scott and I kind of get a little, when people come in, they have a materials list and they're going to tie this and they got to have this specific material for that. And da, 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 da. I know a guy came in years ago and he needed the flight feather from a raven for his brook stone. I'm going like, well, I mean, <laughs> fresh out. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you better get it from a roadkill because because <laughs> otherwise it's illegal to have. Yeah. 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 They ain't so, selling raven yeah. feathers. Uh, yeah. Last I checked. So, yeah, because you can always replace materials. You don't need oh. to – Scott and I are both on the same page there. I mean, color is about the last thing that I even think about. I mean, I, I sure, I'm, I'm kind of doing – Color range. Yeah, I'm doing something realistic, I mean, if I can. But uh, as far as color, I mean, why does parachute atoms work for all kinds of stuff? I mean, it's great. Looks like everything. Yeah, Looks it's like great, food. but it still works for something that's yellow, yeah. whatever. Yeah, because fish are colorblind? <laughs> no fish or not no they yeah. can see in the into the color. can they oh yeah they can go see in the okay UV. they can see uh, into the uv world they can see more colors than we can yeah oh is they yeah. okay a lot of my background and tying definitely comes from learning on my own and 
robbing my mom's throwing box and picking up roadkill. Yeah. I had to tie with whatever I had. <laughs> and so John Bailey used to accuse me of never tying the same fly twice. <laughs> uh, you know, we're tying samples like, well, the new one's better, dude. Yeah. Then he hired you as a consultant. So I think he must have appreciated that at some point, right? So Scott, can you maybe give us an example, you know, like maybe how you develop one of your flies? I, I don't know. The double bunnies, the one that I read a lot about with you. The double bunny basically came from, I mean, I've variety of things but at the time i'd been tying a bazillion kiwi muddlers of jack dennis which is a great fly you know in the old days of shop you get paid in cash so there's your beer money <laughs> and i was noticing you know on the snake the south fork the green uh big fish chasing little fish and i thought i wanted to catch them and at that time, I started saltwater fishing where you're tying these big flies and stuff. It's like, God, oh, maybe I'll throw some of these big saltwater flies. And what I found, at least for me, for the trout is it wasn't animate enough. You had to move it too fast and it was out of the kill zone. And so I was like, what if I kind of combine the attributes of a saltwater fly like a barracuda fly, which undulates with that movement of a kiwi muddler? So you have an undulating moving fly. Uh -huh. And we came up with it and back then we were the, we were the only ones fishing six inch flies yeah. <laughs> and we could do no wrong you know and that kind of evolved uh the ones i fish now are definitely a lot smaller yeah which is much more manageable to cast but they still got a pretty big profile but the and people always ask me for years why don't you try to articulate it once like you know, rabbit height extending out of the hook is articulated on its own. You don't need to. <laughs> well, easier. I mean, it's kind of fun. I mean, it's fun to fish. It looks alive. It's got all kinds of different species on it. The eyes have evolved over the years. The hooks have evolved. I don't use two hooks anymore, and I was standing on my pulpit, and I don't think we should be fishing two, two and three hook flies for trout anymore either. They're kind of rough on them. Right. So are you all sometimes standing in the middle of a stream and you're looking at a hatch and you're thinking this fly isn't quite what I need. And if I only made this adjustment, do you, like, do you get some motivation or inspiration while you're out on the stream and think when I get back to my vice, I'm going to tie up this or that? Yeah, I do. Well, yeah, I do. Completely. For sure. Yeah. And some of yeah. it is the fish weren't quite eating. It didn't quite look right or something. Something was I amiss. can't get, it. I can't get it to float or I can't see it. Yeah. You know, it'd be a great fly, but, but I can't follow it on the water. Yeah, that was perfect, just like you said there. Right? And, I mean, to tell you the truth, I mean, there's very few innovations in fly tying. You know, basically, I mean, if you look at flies, you know, somebody's taken a part from here and a part from there and a part from here and then put them together, and now you have a new fly. I mean, there are some, definitely some stuff over the years, uh, but for the most part, there's really not too much in my opinion, too innovative. I mean, one of my flies basically came from uh, the Yukon Caddis, came from a uh, merger, came from La Fontaine's merger, a sparkle merger, which I just never liked the way that it fished on the surface. You know, they, he had two versions. He had a sinking version and a, and a floating, you know, a drive version. I never liked the way because it just didn't sit on the water right. So I took and just started messing around and modifying the way it did or whatever and came up, came up with that with that pattern it's you know that's to this day i mean geez, that that fly is from uh late 80s uh okay still a killer fly yeah well i'd love to get some pictures of some of these patterns that you guys pioneered if you guys are up for that we could put sure. those out on our website and whatnot and the facebook instagram pages people love looking at that that'd be awesome well we're just running out of time a little bit here and uh i guess i was just kind of I was just kind of wondering, um, you know, like what is something you guys know a lot about fly fishing and about this area, but what have you learned recently? I think I stumped them. <laughs> <laughs> probably for me, it probably more into the steelhead world than it would be into the trout. What would you learn about? Yeah. What'd you learn there? Well, again, you go through all like, like everything you go through all different phases you know at one when i first started steelheading it had to be all dry fly stuff and that that and then i got to like well you know it's in some ways it's much more difficult to fish underneath than it is on top so i got into that and then then same like scott's was saying then we got into starting throwing these monster flies <laughs> whatever miserable to to cast and da, 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 da. and then now i've come back to where somewhere 
still fishing relatively big flies, but somewhere into where the new modern type intruder type things, these big, big flies, uh, but with a little bit more of a traditional look, uh, t- traditional moves and stuff, um, and very relatively large, but very, very, very sparse. Sparse. Interesting. Very, very, very sparse. Uh, not, not a lot there. Um, maybe when they get into the water, they, they expand and have a little bit bigger profile, but not a lot of material uh, on them and, and kind of more into the old traditional, you know, Atlantic salmon, between Atlantic salmon and steelhead stuff, I would say there. And then, yeah. I don't know, it's kind of other stuff there too. So I think the thing I keep relearning is, uh, observe and look around. Oh, totally. I mean, that's probably the thing I, to me, is like you got to kind of keep reminding yourself and kind of breaking things down, and yeah, then yeah. looking at somebody, you know, and breaking out old flies out of your box. And it's like I used to fish this, and I knew why did this work, and why should I fish <laughs> yeah. this now? And I, I go along with you there. I, I forget about that because just what you said, Steve, what you alluded to there. There isn't a time that I don't go out fishing that when I come back that I haven't learned something. That I haven't yeah. something like that, right? There's, this just this but most of the time like i said i can't put a finger on anything right now but most of the time it's just like little things maybe just sure. approaching that i've fished that water forever and ever but i never approached it from this deal or or yeah, that time of right. day and noticing you know that this time of day is a different situation from that time of day yeah do you feel like it, you can kind of get out of that? You might get stuck in a rut almost, and you got to maybe fish with somebody else, you know, somebody you haven't fished with in a long time or, or somebody new to fish with, and you see what they're doing maybe, and it's like, oh, okay. You know, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. I wanted to ask you if you've got any recommendations for angler-friendly watering holes for hungry, thirsty anglers at the end of the day, and I'm sure Jackson's full of them, but is there anything? Right, there's no secrets, I know, but what are your favorite spots? I would say Dornan's at Moose is if you're up in the park has got to be the best view of any bar probably anywhere. I mean, like a 180 degree, degree view of the Tetons, you can sit outside. Oh my gosh! I mean, my my camp. You know? <laughs> Your camp? Okay. <laughs> um, I'll be right over. <laughs> you know, Jackson is blessed with a lot of really very good restaurants and whatever and to tell you the truth there really isn't a lot of like you know uh, local watering holes or whatever that i would say but you know two that i can think of offhand the pretty local would be uh eleanor's uh and cuddy's those those are pretty local uh, and, and and pretty decent bar food you know a lot of tvs if you want to watch sports okay claire sounds good Claire, come on, give us something there. Claire, yeah, Claire. <laughs> come on, you young people, you guys got some other stuff. I'll just do a plug into our, our neighbor, uh, Roadhouse Brewery. That's always a fun yeah, spot right on is. Town Square. There we go. Yeah. All right. All right, Claire, thanks for chiming in there. Claire, is the, as I was saying before the show started, Claire kind of sets up everything and runs everything for these guys, right? Keeps them on track, I guess. Yeah, to- someone's to- got to keep them in line. To- <laughs> That's not possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Very good. Well, listen, you guys, uh, thanks so much for, for being on the show. I uh, really appreciate it. You bet. Thanks. Thank you. Good talking. Yeah, for sure. And uh, come on out and fish with us. You know, I was out there a couple years ago, and uh, I have my one of my daughters and my wife out there, and they're not really fishermen, right? So, uh, well, that's get what's a great about fish. Jackson. Yeah, Gives, so. They got plenty I, right. to do, do here in Jackson uh, while you can go fish. Yeah, in some ways, it's an outdoor destination that has fishing rather than the fishing destination completely. <laughs> right. So uh, anyway, how can uh, people get in touch with you guys and learn more about the fishery? Call us here at the shop or email us. Uh, and if they want to, if they want to get a copy of our fishing newsletter, you can email us or call us and we can send one or email one to you. Yeah. Okay. have it kind of written down for you. Yeah, but just don't over, you know, my thing is I'm pretty old school, but I can get far more done in a five minute phone call than sitting there trading emails and texts back and forth. And like, what is that? What did you mean by that? Because 100%. You know, just a, a simple phone call, five minute phone call. We can cover so much yeah. more than just, you know, just trading, like I said, emails and texts right. back yeah. and forth. 
Give us, a, give us a follow on Facebook and Instagram. We put up weekly fishing reports in the summer and photos. And, um, okay. Everything that's going on, most up to date's on there. All right. Sounds good. Well, listen, I wish you folks extraordinary success and all your adventures to follow. And everybody, thanks for listening. We'll be sure to post pictures of some of the flies we talked about on our Facebook and Instagram pages. And you can DM me or email me with comments and suggestions at shag50 at gmail.com. And if you like the show, hit that share button and tell a buddy. As always, our music is by our brother's fountain, a great little band out of Colorado. Hope you enjoyed the show and we will see you again soon. Tight lines, everybody. Well, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go From the land to the shining sea But I know, I know, I know, I know There's more to life than what the eye can see